America, land of the free and home of the brave, a beacon of hope for those seeking refuge from their broken homes and a shelter for those who need it. An adage often attributed to this powerful country is that it's a land of equal opportunities. But is it really? In a world where actions speak louder than words, America has certainly acted out bias after bias since its inception. Slavery, Irish immigrants, Japanese internment, and, recently, the Middle Eastern refugees. Though arguably one of the biggest arguments against this equal opportunity adage is our corrupt and broken criminal justice system. Although it could be said that the American criminal justice system is passable, this video will focus on the data and scholarly sources collected to prove that the system has four distinct ways in which it discriminates – gender, sexuality, race, and socioeconomic status. These four subjects give us insight as to why there are increased levels of distrust, lack of cooperation, and hatred within the system, as well as shedding some light on some of the ways the system is damaged. In order to determine if any disparities exist in the United States criminal justice system, the team created a Qualtrics survey that asked a variety of questions gauging the participants' demographics and their responses to questions about hot topics and interactions with the criminal justice system. The survey was distributed to English classes at Ball State University via team members' Facebooks, Twitters, Tumblrs, and Instagrams, and finally via mass email to the Ball State email servers. The survey was first distributed to English classes at Ball State University, then via team members' Facebooks, Twitters, Tumblrs, and Instagrams, and finally via mass email to the Ball State email servers. Questions were designed to collect participants' personal experiences with the United States criminal justice system, whether it be through court system, prison system, or law enforcement. Of course, results were collected anonymously and kept confidential. Over 67 individuals completed the Qualtrics survey. Regarding demographics, a majority of participants were young adults between the ages of 18 and 24, female, heterosexual, Caucasian, and have completed some college but have no completed degree. To better understand the results, the team created four cross tabulations and bar graphs in Qualtrics. Each cross tabulation breaks down the survey participants' answers based on race, sexual orientation, gender, and income. Breaking down the results, they found that approximately one in three survey participants had interacted with law enforcement to some extent, regardless of demographic. One of the areas our group decided to research was social class, or socioeconomic status, and its possible association with the criminal justice system. As mentioned by Charles Tittle and Wayne Vilmez, socioeconomic status has long been considered another indicator of crime. It's this particular idea that we wanted to study. Are members of any certain social class, perhaps the working class, more likely to have interacted with the criminal justice system? In our team's research, we attempted to use income and level of education as indicators of social class. Unfortunately, our team didn't find any trends in our data associated with these ideas. Most of our respondents answered with less than $10,000 for their income, which would be highly irregular, but it can be due to college students not understanding what household income means, as almost all of those respondents also said they had either some college or a degree for their education. Outside of that, the other responses to our survey were extremely varied in income. We then turned to our secondary research, which didn't shed much more light on the matter. Wu Yuning and co-authors say, studies show that class conditions the effect of race on satisfaction with police, but their findings are less than conclusive. This leads to an interesting situation where some of the research argued against the idea of class conditioning, while others still pointed towards it. Another scholar, Erika Hashimoto, speculates that poor people are grossly overrepresented in the criminal justice system and suggests that more income data needs to be collected to avoid this issue. Tangentially related is the idea that different classes commit different types of crimes. Low-income individuals may be inclined to commit common crimes that lead to a short trial and jail time, while individuals with higher incomes may be inclined to commit more complex crimes with longer court interactions or to simply bribe or pay their way out of it. Conclusively, there doesn't seem to be enough data from our survey nor our scholarly sources for there to be any meaningful conclusions toward our main argument. A possible solution for this problem will be mentioned in the conclusion. 
often not considered when we think about societal biases, the LGBT plus community is in a weird situation with the law. There's no way for one to know for sure how someone identifies under the spectrum until they tell you. So how can one discriminate against something they can't identify? It's simple, really. Either they're outed by others, or there are assumptions assumed. Regardless, Angela Dwyer brings up a great point in her article, We're not like those weird feather boa covered AIDS spreading monsters, where she says, There's evidence in past research and modern research that found lesbian, gay, and bisexual young people were more likely than heterosexual young people to be stopped by police, expelled from school, and convicted for offenses as adults. Obviously, this is an issue as, if one has to assume someone's sexuality or have it outed by them from someone else, then how can one even be sure of it? This should be throwing up major red flags. The issue here is that the bias based on sexuality can often be used as a scapegoat against other individuals of societal minorities. Another area to look into would be the court system, as this represents a unique issue with the idea of equality. Russell Robinson points out the fact that the LGBT plus community receives favorable bias in their court cases in his article on equal protection, where he says there's three ways they benefit. One, not having to prove their classification. Two, being able to invoke animus, an act which calls to attention the idea of a congressional or private desire to cause harm or bias against the politically unpopular, while other marginalized cases cannot. And finally, three, they don't have to provide a definitive answer for how their case might affect future cases or precedences. This means that both the article and general public agree with each other, albeit in a tangential way, where the people from our survey think that the court systems are just biased in general, while the scholarly source argues that the court system is biased in favor of those with LGBT+. This all puts the LGBT plus community in a weird situation, where societally, they're both extremely accepted by most, while also unjustly despised by others, which can ironically be shown in the regard that they're treated unfairly with police and jail interactions, while treated favorably with the court system. Another lens we were interested in examining the criminal justice system through was an individual sex or gender, as a common misconception is that women can easily manipulate the system to their advantage. Although women represent a small portion of the offender population when they commit a crime that violates society's gender norms, it can have notable consequences for their behaviors and cognition. This is because they are processed through a criminal justice system designed for male offenders. This is relevant to the article, Criminal Justice System Involvement and Gender Stereotypes by authors Rivera and Bonita, where they focused on gender stereotyping within the criminal justice system and its impact on females' criminal identity. They said, women who have had a criminal experience but believe that such behavior is inconsistent with their societal roles view themselves as having failed in their social roles. For example, while male and criminal may be reinforcing links to self, female and criminal result in an imbalance due to the link between self and the outgroup. This can lead to things like cognitive dissonance and behavioral consequences. The relationship between police officers and society is changing in terms of police officers rejecting the notion that there exists a physical and emotional barrier between themselves and their citizens, which is the essence of professional policing according to J.R. Lasley. In their article, Ethnicity, Gender, and Police Community Attitudes, they examine the relationship between a police officer's gender and attitudes toward police-public interpersonal relationships which suggests that gender is not a significant predictor of officers' attitudes toward the occupational role with community members. Rather, it was discovered that community-mindedness on the part of officers is a product of individual police community attitudes. This brings to mind that gender and police corruption do not have a correlation, and that corruption and abuse of power is the result of poor police and community interactions which shows through our survey when a majority of our participants said they felt safe around police. So, for all the damages and issues within the system, it seems gender is a mixed bag of blessings when examining the criminal justice system. This is because police problems are related to community interaction and not gender, while jail seems to be a detriment to anyone whose natural born sex isn't male. The last most relevant issue we'll be examining is the relationship between an individual's race and their interaction with the criminal justice system. Not only is this a hot topic, it's also something that's becoming more and more politically charged as the years go on. 
The first subject to look into is mass incarceration and the relationship between an individual's race and their interaction with the courts, which has been a point of contention since the early 1990s. As David Muster brings up in his journal, Racial, Ethnic, and Gender Disparities in Sentencing, Hispanics and Blacks receive approximately 68.5% and 99.6% larger average sentencing than whites respectively. As this quite clearly and obviously shows, anyone who is not white is going to have a bad time when interacting with the court system, which is only compounded when one takes into account the increased amount of police profiling and unfair targeting that many racial minorities face. Another aspect of the racial issues within the criminal justice system is something that John Burris and Catherine Whitney bring up in their book, Blue vs. Black, which is the fact that the Human Rights Watch organization cited excessive use of force primarily directed against blacks and Hispanics, and they also talked about how this excessive use of force includes unjustified shootings, severe beatings, fatal chokings, and unnecessarily rough physical treatment. So as we quite literally just quoted, there is a strong correlation between the arrestee's race and the amount of force used which means there's no equal treatment of citizens under the current policing system. As the evidence shows, there should be no doubt in anyone's mind that there's an unfair advantage to being Caucasian in the criminal justice system, which the article What It's Like to be Black in the Criminal Justice System brings up in the multitude of graphs they've created, which are on the screen now. So there's no way around this, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, the system is broken. As we hope you've come to the conclusion of, there's something inherently broken with a system, be it the obvious and rampant racial discrimination, the psychologically damaging gender stereotypes, or even the less tangible orientation biases that exist within the system. Something needs to change if we plan to keep calling our country the land of golden opportunities. Now, offering criticism without offering solutions is just whining. So how can we fix a system that, in theory, should be free of hatred and bias? Well, a comprehensive example would be what John L. Burris and Catherine Whitney bring to the table in their book, Blue vs. Black. They offer a 10-step reformation plan that starts with retraining police, judges, and jail employees before working its way up to implementing fairness and equality laws at the last stages. Or, alternatively, another solution is to put another check and balance into the system. The people. Alicia McGregor brings up an example in their article, Politics, Police Accountability, and Public Health when they go in-depth on the story about a U.S. mayor who had to fight and stand wave after wave of enemy attacks from their political allies and adversities as they worked towards a public forum for the people to critique police. Of course, this came to fruition. So, to bring us back to our first question, is this a land of equal opportunities? Sadly, no. Not in its current state. And it will continue to stay this way until we, the citizens who care, take action to save this sinking ship. The best solution would be to just get out there and contact your representatives, to vote for those who believe in equality, and to stand up and march with those who share your ideas on the matter. Maybe then, and only then, can we live up to the image that these refugees and non-white Americans wish for this country to have.